So the title of my sermon this morning is Unwrap the New You. Unwrap the New You. Paul moves into his practical chapter in Colossians chapter 3. He's talked about the supremacy of Jesus Christ, who he is. Thankful for these Colossian believers. They've put their faith in Jesus. They're a young church plant. He's never actually met them face to face. And the question is like, okay, who is the real Jesus, the true Jesus, and his, is he enough, or do we need something else and something more? And Paul's writing to exalt Christ and say, no way. This is the image of the invisible God. He is the supreme creator. Everything that was made was made by him and through him and for him. In him all things hold together. He is the fullness of the Godhead in humanity, Jesus Christ. That's who he is. And then he's warning them in chapter 2 not to be taken captive or led astray by the false ideas that creep in. It says what you really need to have new spiritual life, what you really need to have full life and victory and fullness and vitality, what you need to really change you and make you powerful and new is you need this regulation. You need this special experience. You need this spiritual spiritual gimmick. You need to just work harder, try harder, be more, you know, do this, do that. Does it work? What's Paul say at the end of chapter two? It's all of these man-made regulations, all of these human philosophies, these false ideas that are creeping into the church, saying that you need this to unlock the mystery and the secret of the Christian life. You need this and you need that. You need this spiritual gimmick. Paul says, oh, by the way, they're all powerless and worthless to actually restrain the sensual, sinful flesh that we have. What's he saying? They don't work. They don't work because they're not true. That's why Pastor Kyle came and preached the sermon, this is the way. Jesus Christ is the exclusive king. He is the way, and the cross of Jesus Christ is full and final victory that disarmed the powers and authorities, nailing your sin to the cross. Jesus is the Son of God, exclusive, unique, the one and only, one of a kind, the cosmic creator, Lord, the fullness of divine revelation, the fullness of divine redemption. He is supreme and he is sufficient. He is all that you need. When we we come to Christmas time, we ask the question, who is Jesus? Paul answered us, in chapter 1. Why did he come? And Paul answers us in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he came as the exclusive king and he came to die. Why? So that you could unwrap the new you. So that you could be free and live new. That's what we're going to see as we jump into God's word here. If you've got a Bible or it's going to be on the screen as well, read along. I'm going to read all of chapter 3, then I'm going to pray and we'll dive in this morning, and we're going to look at Paul's answer to how. How do we live new now? How do we unwrap the new you as we unwrap the true meaning of Christmas? Who is Christ? Why did he come? Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, Paul's continuing his instruction. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Speaking to these new Christians, you've You're united with him by faith. You've been raised with him. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There he's talking about Jesus' second coming the second advent. Verse 5. Now here you're going to see Paul's writing in very, these are imperatives. These are strong language. These are commands. He's instructing them. This is now how you live new. This is how you live the true Christian life, the new Christian life in Christ. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these The wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, 
since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is neither Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. He's saying everyone needs Christ equal. Everyone can get Christ equal, no matter who you are, where you come from. You got to take off the old and put on the new. Verse 12, now writing to the Colossians, he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, <sighs> I swear that, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And he gets specific with some specific roles and responsibilities within our families. As Christians now, Christian homes, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Now we'll go into chapter 4, verse 1 to complete this section. He says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this little letter, the Colossians. We thank you for Christmas time. We pray now, Lord, that your word and your Holy Spirit would break through our minds, our hearts, that you would show us what you want us to see. Let us hear what you want us to hear. Father, we thank you for the hope and the reality of the power of the new life that you came to give us, to bring us, to make possible. We could walk in a new life put off the old, put on the new. Would you instruct us, encourage us, show us the way forward, Father. Help me to be helpful this morning. And we thank you again for your word, for your spirit, for the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, where we get to practice this and live it out together. Thank you for the gift of family. Thank you for, Lord, all that you've done for us. And we ask for your help now and your guidance in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Here's the big idea of the sermon. Jesus Christ came to give you new life. Jesus Christ came to give you new life. Who was he? The, the image of the invisible God, the Son of God, that's who he is, clearly on display. Why, why did he come? He came to die. Why did he die? To set you free, to give you new life. Mystery box opened. You actually can now be set free from the controlling power of sin. You're no longer enslaved. If you're in Christ, good news, you can unwrap the new you and you can live new now. You can live new now. Between his first coming and his second coming. Notice you see there in verse 4, it says that, verse 3 says that you, for you died, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ appears, who is your life, then you also will appear with him in glory. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about the second advent, the second Noel. You see, friends, the first Noel the first advent, that's what we celebrate at Christmas time. We zoom in on the event of Christ's birth. 
We zoom in on the, on the advance, the breaking in, the tearing open of the heavens, heaven coming down to set us free, to save us. Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem, in a manger. He comes into the story he, and he advances God's plan and program, but it's also helpful for, us, helpful for us at Christmas time to not only zoom in on his birth, but to also zoom out on the entire reality of why he came, the Christ event. Yes, he was born to what to live, to what to die, to what to rise, to what to be seated at the right hand of the Father, taking back his rightful place at the throne, to what empower you to live new until what he returns again. Friends, God may take his time, but he always keeps his word. He's coming again. And in the meantime, Paul's instructing us, how can you actually live new now between the first advent and the second advent? Because here's the reality, folks. The first Noel made the new life possible. The second Noel will make the old life impossible. Is that good news for anybody? His return, when he appears, then your life will appear with him. Meaning, you when you're united to Jesus by faith, when you're a Christian, you become a Christian, that's when your new life begins. You become a follower of Jesus. You are now tethered to a life source fixed in heaven that is objective, that doesn't get weak or grow old, fixed in heaven. Jesus is your source of life. He now defines you. He now fills you. I said in chapter one that Colossians is written to thrill you with Christ, fill you with Christ, and propel you for Christ. Paul's saying this new is possible. New. Merry Christmas. Merry, 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 Merry Christmas. Here's a gift. Unwrap the new you. It's a gift. You can unwrap the new you. You see, the question is, because we live in a broken world, don't we? How many of you, you're honest, you say, man, I'm still a work in progress. Anybody here is a work in progress? Go ahead and point to your neighbor as well. This is one of those times you can, they're really a real work. That's a, uh, right here, but that, yeah, work, work in progress. So the question is, where is your hope for new where is your hope for lasting change? Where is your hope for real progress now? Are you stuck? Hmm. Where's your hope for change? Because not only are we looking at Christmas, but as we move towards 2021, bless the Lord, as we move towards a new year, what Paul's saying here is, look, the man-made attempts, this isn't turn over a new leaf. This isn't by this spiritual gimmick. You need this spiritual experience. You need this extra regulations. You need to just buck up and figure it out and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and turn over a new leaf. You need to change yourself and then you'll be holy and then you'll be loved and then you'll be chosen. Good news, good news. Paul's not saying that you need a new year resolution. He's saying you need a new you revelation. This is who you are. This is who you are. This is where your life is. This is what you have access to. This is what now you are called to do. And what you're called to do, you can do in Jesus because he came to set you free. He came to give you a new life that starts now. You can live new now. Where's your hope for real change, for real progress, for real newness? Is it in your subjective feelings and your performance day in and day out? Well, I did good for a few days and then I kind of fell off the wagon. Is it in your subjective feelings and how you do up and down? Or is it in the objective reality of who Jesus is and who he says you are and what's true of you and that you can become in experience increasingly so what you already are positionally in Christ? Unwrap the new you. Merry Christmas. He came to give you new life. He came to give us new life. Your hope for real change. Paul is being crystal clear. You see, chapter three, he's getting so practical. He's saying imperative, put to death and put on and these things. Is he giving you a backpack full of rocks? Merry Christmas. Oh, just try harder. No, he's saying your hope for real change is not in yourself and what you 
must do, but it's in the person and power of Jesus Christ and what he's already done for you and who you are now in him. You in Christ, Christ in you, you hidden with Christ in God. Your new position in Christ comes with new promise and power and makes new life possible until Christ returns. You see, we can live new now by faith in Jesus Christ until we live new forever by sight with Jesus Christ. Did you hear me? We can live new now by faith in Jesus until he returns and we live new forever by sight with Jesus. I think that's good news. So the question then is, how do we live new now? How do you unwrap the new you this Christmas? How do you unwrap the new year, the new you as you move into a new year? And more good news, friends, it's not by the power of good advice. It's by the power of good news. It's by the power of good news. Let's look at what Paul says here in the text. I've got six things for us answering the question, how do we live new now? Number one, Keep it on the bottom shelf here. Number one, place your faith in Christ. Place your faith in Christ. Notice Paul begins saying, since then you've been raised with Christ. Very clear. Who is Paul writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who he's thankful for that they have placed their faith in Christ. And so everything he's going to instruct them, command them, call them to, and tell them following that is on the basis of them being united with Christ. Meaning, how do you get in on the benefits and blessing of this new life power that is in Christ. How do you get in on it? You get in on it by placing your faith in Christ. Because what faith in Christ does is that's what unites us with Jesus. And when you're united with Jesus by faith, his life becomes your life. His death becomes your death. His resurrection becomes your resurrection. And he says, since then, we've been raised with Christ. The old you has died. New spiritual life has come through faith in Jesus Christ. Because, friends, here's a sub point to point number one. Placing your faith in Christ is not a finish line. It's a starting line. It's not the conclusion to this sermon. It's the first point. Because everything else I'm going to say is contingent upon whether or not you've placed your faith in Christ. So Paul's writing to believers here. So the question is, is he writing to you? Is he writing to you? New life doesn't start when you die and go to heaven. New life starts when you place your faith in Jesus. When you get spiritually united to Christ, you come alive in Christ. So the, the awesome thing about a Christmas season when you're reflecting on your life and who am I and how is my life going and how are my relationships and what's going on in my life and where am I going and reflecting about Maybe questions about God are entering your mind, and where am I really with God, and how am I doing with God? Listen, friends, what an awesome time to come home for Christmas, to come spiritually home, to place your faith in Christ, to come home to your loving Heavenly Father who loves you. You can come home for Christmas. Place your faith in Christ. New life can begin. You can begin to unwrap the new you. Amen? Amen? But that's the starting point, not the ending point. So here we go. Number two, set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on things above, he says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think about all of the things that you and I and in this world that we set our hearts on. Think about all the things that we can set our heart on. If I just had that, if I could just get there, if it was just for, if it was just, if this would just work out, if just this thing, think about the things that you chase, that you have chased, that you're prone to chase. Paul says, look, since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Christ is treasured above all. He's, when you set your hearts on him, he's the one thing, the, the one you can put your hope in who won't let you down. 
The things of this earth, the things of this world won't satisfy the cravings and longing of your soul. Set your hearts on Christ. Paul said, I want you to be satisfied, and he is satisfaction. He is life. Set your hearts on things above. You see, we saw in chapter 2, victory flows from the cross, but friends, life flows from the throne. Victory flows from the cross. At the cross, your enemy that stood against you, the accusations, the condemnation that stood against you, nailed to the cross. Jesus came. He came to be king. He came to die, to defeat the powers of the enemy, to take the wrath of God in your place for your sin. And then he rose victorious, and then he went back to his rightful place at the throne. And he sits there now, and from there flows the life to empower you, to unwrap the new you, and live new now. It flows from the throne. Where's Jesus? He ain't in the manger no more. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said. He came to live, to die, to rise, to return to heaven. Heaven still coming down, filling you, propelling you to live new now. Set your hearts on things above Life flows. Friends, there's a manger, and there's a cross, and there's a throne. And that's where Jesus is right now. And Paul says, set your hearts there. And he's coming again. He's coming again, but set your hearts there. That's what will fuel you until he returns. Set your hearts there. Thirdly, set your minds on things above. You see in verse 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The life of the mind. What's your thinking? Who do you think you are? Who do you think Jesus is? What dominates your thought life? Paul says, if you want to live new now, you've got to set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. You've got to remind yourself again and again about what's true about you, what's true about Jesus, what def- who and what defines you. Because he says, look, not on earthly things. This stuff, the old you, for you died. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. That no longer defines you. You're now wrapped in Christ. You want to unwrap the new you? Get wrapped in Christ. Set your minds on things above. You see, don't buy into the lies of the offers of satisfaction in something else. Don't buy into the lies. The enemy comes. What does he bring? What's the tactics of the enemy in our life? He brings temptation, saying, hey, this shiny thing over here, this is what you need. Don't give in to the temptation. Set your minds on things above. Don't give in to the accusations. Set your minds on things above. Don't give in to the condemnation. Set your minds on things above. Those are the tactics that the enemy uses in our life. And Paul's saying, guard your mind. Who or what defines you? The old life died with Christ and is buried. The power of that has been broken. You can live new now. You remember, the, you remember the, when you were a kid? Any of you remember that little playground saying? I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. When the enemy comes accusing you and condemning you, praise God, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The enemy comes condemning you. You say, listen, that guy died. I died. I'm no longer that person. Since then, I've been raised with Christ, and my life is now hidden with Christ in God. Satan, you're the one that's condemned. I'm rubber, you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. (laughs) I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Go ahead, Satan. In chapter 1, Paul says, listen, you are now holy in his sight, free from accusation, without blemish in the presence of God because of the grace of God. Merry Christmas. That's who you are. That's where your real life, true life is hidden. That's where it flows from when Satan comes accusing, condemning, and tempting you. You say, man, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That no longer defines me. That no longer satisfies me. The old is gone. The new has come. Merry Christmas. Your life is now hidden 
with Christ in God. You see the language Paul uses in Colossians? In Christ. Christ in you. You in Christ who's hidden in God. So, so, so before you were in sin and sin was in you and now Christ comes and when you place your faith in Christ, the Spirit of God and Jesus, the gospel, rips the lid off of you and takes sin and puts Christ in you and puts you in Christ and puts Christ in God. How are you doing? You, you think maybe there's some security there? Set your minds on things above. What's true about you? Who, who or what defines you? Who do you think you are? He said, my life is now hidden with Christ in God. That's, Paul says, that's how you live the new life. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. Number four, put to death. Rid yourself of, put off the old. Paul's saying, out with the old. See, so some of us, the reality is, we got to go through the closet. It's time to put off the old and put on the new. Here's the good news of salvation in Jesus. Here's the good news of Christianity. That when you put your faith in Christ, Paul described even again in chapter 1, what happens to you is you've been qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. You've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of the son that he loves. You've been traded. You're on a new team. You get a new jersey. You get a new playbook. You run new plays. You got a new coach. The old is gone. Put off the old. What do I do with the old jersey? Throw it away. It's not you anymore. We don't run those plays anymore. Paul's saying you can put off the old and you can put on the new. Notice the, the language he uses and, in, and the descriptions here under this of the actions and the attitudes and the speech of, that describe the old and describe the new. He says, put to death. Now, again, this isn't like, hey, you know, if you feel like it, you know, might be a good idea, maybe. You know, I mean, Paul's saying, look, like, like put to death. Like, that is no longer you. In other words, Paul's saying, give no quarter to sin in your life. You want to have a Merry Christmas? Deal aggressively with your sin. Be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Paul says, put to death. Rid yourself. That's the old you. That doesn't define you anymore. We're not to go back to that anymore. And here's the good news is you now have tools, you have weapons, you have power that actually work to put to death the stuff that used to define you. Notice, he's saying real change, real progress, real hope is possible because there are real resources. In other words, good news, friends, in Christ you're not stuck in sin. Did you hear me? In Christ, you're not stuck in sin. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. You're no longer defined by your sin. You're not stuck in your sin. You're not saying, well, that's just the way I am. I can't make any progress. This is what I've done. This is what's been done to me. I'm just a victim of life and circumstances. Paul says, no, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, how you've been raised, what's happened. You are not defined by sin any longer if you're in Christ. You're not stuck in sin. You can make real progress. You can put to death the old and you can put on the new. Merry Christmas, unwrap the new you. It's been promised, it's been purchased, it's made possible, time for you to put it on. Unwrap it. Take it out of the box. Open it up, take it out, take off the old, chuck it, put on the new. And you can. Because Jesus Christ came to give you new life. Hey, good news. You're not stuck. I mean, okay. Twenty twenty hasn't been ideal. <laughs> right? And what's wild is, I'm, I'm here telling you, new life is possible. Okay, but guess what? We know we got you. Got eyes. You got a brain. The old life is still possible. We live in a broken world. There's real brokenness. How many know you're a work in progress? 
So is your neighbor, right? We know there's things, and you're honest, you're not honest, and, and we get that, t- man, there's things about me that, that I know need to change, that I want to change. Sometimes the problem is, like, do I really want to change? Right? The, the old is still there. This is really, really good news. This is what sets Christianity apart from any other religion and any other claim, is that there is actual power and power. And the promise of real power to make real progress. You can change. You're not stuck. Jesus Christ came in the flesh so that his body would be killed in the flesh to free you from your sinful flesh. Don't tell me about the chains still around your ankle. Jesus came and died to break those chains and set you free and make you new. You've been bought with a price. If you're in Christ, you're not stuck anymore. You're not stuck. We're not stuck. You see, the miracle of salvation is that you move from being spiritually dead in your sin to being spiritually alive and dead to sin. We move from being dead in sin, powerless, enslaved, hopeless, stuck. Jesus tore open the heavens and broke in to set us free. And now we move from being dead in sins to being alive in Christ and dead to sins. That's not me anymore. It doesn't define me. It doesn't rule over me anymore. I can make progress and move forward. I don't need a new year resolution. I need a new you revelation. And Jesus says, that's who I am. Set your hearts, set your minds, put off. No matter who you are. Verse 11, doesn't matter. Jew, Gentile, Scythian, slave, barbarian, free. Listen, I don't matter what side of the tracks you think you came from. There's no class A, class B, class C, VIP. Listen, no matter what, it's equal opportunity centers in here. Hey, I mean, I, you know what? The old is old and it's stinky and old on all of you. And the new is new. And if you're in Christ, it's new and it's for you. And you can't disqualify yourself. Well, no. It's just the way I am. You can be free from lust that dominates your mind and your heart. You can be free from anger and rage and malice. You can be free from bitterness. The stuff's still in there, the lying, the stuff, right? But it's possible to unwrap the new you. Number five, clothe yourself. Put on the new Out with the old, on with the new. Notice how Paul starts this section, verse 12, grounding this imperative, this command to now clothe yourself. So put to death, take off, rid yourself, off of the old, go through the closet. This isn't me anymore. I've been traded. I'm on a new team, new jersey, new playbook, new plays. He describes those. Notice how he grounds those in the good news of what Jesus Christ has already done for you, the fuel and the resources and the power to propel you to live that new life. Are found in Christ and what he's already done for you. You're fueled by grace, not performance. You're fueled by your grace, not your performance. Look what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. Did you catch that? What are the false ideas that were creeping into the church? It's saying, it's man's regulation, it's man's philosophy, it's earthly things. Do this, buy that, get that, try this, have this experience, do this, be this way, do this. If you change, then you'll be chosen. If you change, then you'll be holy. If you change, then you'll be loved. The gospel comes along and says, no, you're chosen, you're holy, you're loved, therefore you can change. False Dead religion says, I change, therefore I'm loved. The gospel says, I'm loved, therefore I change. You see, man's effort, earthly attempts, turn over a new leaf, try harder. You can try all you want. The end of chapter 2 says, powerless and worthless at restraining the sensual indulgence. You can't dig out that anger in your heart with a spoon. 
You can't get the stuff and the gunk that's in there. You can't get it out on your own. It's powerless. It's, it's worthless. You can't do it. Praise God in Jesus Christ. He comes along and says, therefore, I can change you from the inside out. The power, the hope, and the resources and the gospel of Jesus Christ are more than man's attempts. The world strives in our flesh, our sinful flesh, we strive for holiness. If I could just change, then I'd be accepted. If I could just become this, if I could just tackle this issue, if I could just get here, then I would be loved. Then I would be accepted. We strive for holiness and love. And that is the end game of false religion. Strive for. If you can perform, if you can strive for. The gospel does not have holiness and love as the end game. It has holiness and love as the engine. You strive from, I'm holy and loved. I'm already secure and accepted and adopted. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. I can be thrilled with Christ, filled with Christ, and propelled for Christ. Why? Because I'm chosen. I'm holy. I'm loved in Jesus. That's who I am. My life is hidden with Christ in God and I'm pulling down the reality of the, the transfer that's happened of who I am positionally and spiritually in Christ, and I'm bringing that down daily, day in, day out, into the reality of my walk and war in this journey, because the reality is the new is possible, but the old is possible for the time being. It's good news, it's a gift, and it's war. How often do you get dressed? Okay, pre-2020, all right? Like, I know, again, everyone, usually, remember back when we used to get dressed every day in pre-20, you know? Some of those days, a few of you, yeah, working from home, and I don't need to get dressed today. <laughs> How often you get dressed? Every day, right? That's a reminder of the reality of how do you live new now? You take off the old, you put on the new. You put on the new. You set your hearts on things above. You set your minds on things above. You take off the old. You put on the new every day. Right, what are these new clothes? Look at how Paul describes them. He says it's things like compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Woo! How did the Lord forgive you? Freely, immediately, completely. Mm. He says, put on love. He says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Uh, how often do you get dressed? How often do you put on clothes? Every day. So me yesterday... Okay, here's the deal. Some of you, I, I live near a place called Knowles Road, okay? And there's, there's this really awesome and really cool house lights display that a lot of people like to see, okay? And so I'm telling you that the Lord, I was arguing with the Lord yesterday, okay? This was happening last night. I'm like, Lord, that patience that you gave me, it's not the right size. It don't fit me anymore because these people are in the road. There's a reason the Lord Jesus is not letting my horn work right now. Oh, my Lord Jesus, bear with one another. I'm like, put on the new, put on the new. This is a road still, people. Get out of it. People still live here. i got to drive to my house. It's just bear with one another. Forgive one. Okay, Lord. I'm like, but that was talking about the church. So Christians, I'll do that with the Christians. Is this person a Christian? I don't know. Beep, beep. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like, Lord, that patience you bought me just feels a little small. <laughs> Daily. Daily. Situation by situation. How do you know when you're wearing the new clothes? What's the point? He says, it's in relationship. It's in the context of relationships in the church, in the home, at work. This is the reality of where the new you gets put on, the new you gets lived out in the context of relationships. How do you know if you're wearing compassion? How do you know if you're wearing patience? 
How do you know if you're wearing bear with one another? Let me tell you, you know it. You know it in relationship with people. Daily. Unwrap the new you. Daily. You can live new now. Even on Noel's Road, you know? <laughs> Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You see, that's not saying like, Yo, if you feel like it, hey, give peace a try. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Because there's a rebellion rising up. In there, is there no peace of Christ? Rule, put that down. Why? Because the world's gonna know we've been given new life, the gift of new life. The world's gonna see we're wearing new. Hey, by the way, Merry Christmas. Jesus got new clothes for everybody in here today. Come on. <laughs> Merry Christmas. He's got new clothes. Come on. Come on. Unwrap it. Take it out. Put it on. Put it on with one another. Put it on in your family tomorrow. Christmas Eve, come on, put it on. The word, they're going to know. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. There's a way in which we're in relationship with one another that puts on display the reality of the power of the living Christ flowing from the throne of God, positionally filling his people, propelling you to live new now. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ on you is the power to live new now. Christ on you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ on you, the power to live new now in every relationship. And that's the final point, number six. Live new now in every relationship and in every endeavor. I love this. It changes the gospel, the good news of Christmas. When you unwrap the true meaning of Christmas, who Christ is and why he came, you simultaneously begin to unwrap the new you. And it's possible to live new in every interaction and in every endeavor. New motivational center, a new engine gets put in. And now wives, husbands, children, fathers, workers, employers, employees, this, this is in every relationship, in the church, in the home, and at work, and in the school, in every relationship, and in every endeavor, it's possible. Look what Paul says. He says, with all your heart, not only does, does the power of Jesus and being united with Jesus, not only does it change how you live, it changes how you live because it changes who you live for. And now it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As though living for Christ, not for man. You do it with all your heart, all in. Now it's possible to strive from love, from acceptance, from grace, from holiness. Transforms the way I live every day for the rest of my life. From his first advent to his second advent until he returns, I can live new now and I put it in play. I run the new playbook in every relationship and in every endeavor. Friends, as you move into 2021, you can hit the gas for Jesus. You can live new now at home, especially at home. To be honored most by those who know you best to live new at home, to live new at work, to live new at church, to put on Christ with all your heart, with excellence for the Lord, not men. We can go for it because we're already loved by God. And our righteousness and our acceptance and our security doesn't go up and down by our performance. It's not based on our subjective experience. It's based on the objective reality that Jesus Christ came, lived, died, 
rose, sits at the throne. Jesus really came wrapped in swaddling cloths, wrapped in human flesh. He really came. He really died. It really matters. He really rose. It really matters. He really sits at the right hand of God. You say, why does Paul contrast the false religions? He says, they're powerless. They can't do. They can't. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's not true. You see, Christianity isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. Christianity isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. Because Jesus Christ really was a man who really lived, really died, really rose, really sits at the right hand of heaven and really can fill you, change you, make you new, propel you to live new. It works in every relationship and every endeavor because it's objectively true. So the question, how would you live if you knew you were completely loved, completely accepted, and completely secure? How would you live in the new year if you had his love, holiness, acceptance, and grace as the engine, not the end game? How would you live Here's my final thought, and I'll tell a story we've done. In Christ, there are more reasons for hope and more resources for change than any other religion or claim. Paul is giving us in this passage, he's giving us in the truth about Jesus and the truth about Christmas in Christ There are more reasons for hope and more resources for change. Paul says, since then you've been raised. Fix, set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. There's more reasons for hope and more resources for change. Therefore, you can unwrap, open, take out, and put on the new you. In 1997, Christmas 1997, the Lord got a hold of my life in 1997, in April. I was 19 years old. And for a couple of months, I thought there were still some of the old plays that I could run. I thought, you know, I can still run some of these old plays. It's not that big a deal. You know, there there was this, this new was beginning to come, but the old was still there. I was in this process God had shown me my sin. I had realized I had strayed from the Lord. I knew I needed to come home. He accepted me, forgave me. It was a radical change. New life started for for me personally, April 22nd, 1997. Wrestled with that old, and I'm not saying that I've not wrestled with the old since I've wrestled with this old for 23 years. Since that day, months into my new life in Christ, I get to December, I get to Christmas, I go home for Christmas. Christmas Eve, phone rings, you know, hey, Adam, come on, man, let's hang out. It's the old old team. I blew it. I blew it. My first Christmas. Ran the old plays that night. I resisted, and then I didn't. And I was devastated. I was dejected, and I expected to be rejected because I didn't understand grace yet. I did, but I didn't. There's more to unwrap. I came home and went to the house of some dear precious people who had welcomed me in. They were teaching me about Jesus. Teaching me about his grace. And this new life that's possible. And they could tell something was wrong. And I said, I blew it. 
And he said to me, you know, Adam, it's not about where you are, but the direction you're heading. Look at how God is changing your life. Look at how far you've come. Because my question, I was like, have I, what do I do now? Like, I, 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 I knew he would forgive me, and I, and I received it. I, I've been trying to live for him, and, and, now, and, now, I, and now I do this? Like, did I, did I use it up? Is it all gone? Like, the analogy I gave in the other service was like, God gave me a Slurpee, and I, and I drank it all. Now what? <laughs> Terrible analogy. Like, Slurpee? Grace? Really? But I don't know. It just comes to my mind sometimes. I don't know. So, but like, it's like, I'm like, I used it up. Did I use it up? And that night I had a, I had a, a dream, a vision, an image. I, I pictured myself and I, it's like the Lord was showing me what had happened. I, 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 was, he, I was dressed in white. He had given me new clothes. He had, he had forgiven me. He had cleansed me. He had changed my life. There were dramatic changes happening in my life. Much of the old was gone and the new was coming. And, there was this, and I'm dressed in white and I walked out the back door of my childhood home and walked the two blocks down the alley toward the small town school where I was raised. And there was a puddle at the end of the alley and I'm dressed in the white clothes that Jesus has given me. And I fall in the puddle and I jumped in. That's what we do in our sin, right? It's not like, oh, I fell in. I mean, I was tempted, but then I'm like, I jumped in. On Christmas Eve. And I walked back down the alley home, mud, over the new clothes Jesus gave me, the new white clothes he gave me. Come up to my back door, and Jesus meets me at the door. He says, Adam, come here, I want to show you something. Walk through the hallway of my house, up to my room, upstairs. Open my room, and there's dressers along the wall. He says, come here. Opens the drawer. Every drawer and every dresser, more white clothes. He said, Adam, there's more where those came from. And then he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, the next time, I'll teach you to walk around the puddle. He said, Adam, you don't have to fall in the puddle. You're not destined for the puddle anymore. You're not stuck in the mud anymore. That's not who you are. Here's new white clothes. You get up and you walk and you live for me, and I'll teach you how to walk around the puddle because you can live new now. Paul wrote to Titus in chapter 2, Therefore the salvation, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us to say no to unrighteous, unrighteousness, to live self-controlled and godly lives in this present age while we await the blessed hope and the glorious return of our Savior. From the first advent until the second advent, you can live new now. His grace will save you and it doesn't run out, but his grace can also teach you to say no, to put to death the old, to take off the old, and to put on the new. Merry Christmas. Jesus Christ came to give you new life as a gift fueled by his grace. You can unwrap the new you. You can open it up, take it out, put it on. Some of you may need to go through your closet. Friends, more reasons for hope more resources for change. Put it on. You can. You can. You can. Put it on. Good news. Merry Christmas. You're not stuck. You're not stuck. New life. He can get the stuff that's in there. Only Jesus can get it out. Only Jesus can make it new. Only Jesus. He came to die to set you free, to give you new life. It starts 
when you place your faith in Jesus. And one day, when he returns, the old will be impossible. But until then, unwrap the new you. And so, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray that you would empower us by your grace, fill us with hope. Lord, that your spirit would do a work. Lord, as we put on our Christmas PJs this week, Lord, that we would be reminded, Jesus, that you came and died to give us new life, to set us free, that we're no longer defined by the old, but that you make us new and that our life is hidden with you, secure, we're loved, we're accepted, not because of what we do, but because of what you've done. Lord, would, would you teach us, teach us how to walk around the puddles before us in the new year, Lord, the places we get stuck. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to set us free, that we're not left in our stuckness, we're not left in the muck and mire. Help us, Father, to unwrap the new and to live new by the power of Jesus and for the name of Jesus, to be propelled to live with all our heart, soul, mind, strength, in all that we do, in every relationship, in every endeavor, help us, Father. Thank you for the gift of new life. And anyone, Lord, who is, you are calling home this Christmas, Lord, help them know that your grace is available and free. It doesn't run out. Lord, you offer new life. Help us receive it again. Help us receive it even now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.